Thank you, Anthony. Great report as always. And I love Anthony when he puts together these segments because did everyone love that picture of Anthony Weiner? I know I sure did. Go to longcrime.com to follow a little bit more of those stories. But I want to talk about that cold case because today's cold case day. Cold cases that are now turning very hot. So let's talk a little bit more about this with my very special guest joining me this morning. In studio, law and crime analyst, Jonna Spillboard. Jonna, great to see you. Good morning, Jesse. Good morning. And on via Skype, we have with us law enforcement expert and fellow Hello, host here on Law and Crime, Vincent Hill. Vincent, great to see you. Hey, good morning, Jesse. Good to see you. Good to see you. Now, um, I want to start with you, Jonna. Mm -hmm. Here's the interesting thing. We're talking about DNA evidence, and this really is DNA, the cold case day. Yeah. DNA evidence from so long ago mm -hmm. is being used in court, would be used in court today. Is that admissible? What are the problems there? Well, it's actually, yes, it would be admissible, but here's the thing. This case is straight out of law and order because, look, you think you have somebody who got away with murder 32 years ago, right? Because back then, we didn't have the testing procedures that we have today. So when you're able to match up DNA from over 30 years ago to something today, it actually, it's very compelling evidence for a jury. Um, unlike our other cold case that we're going to be talking about, where we're not so sure we have that. So yes, I think this type of evidence is very compelling because people love to solve crimes. People love the science that they see on television and shows like Law and & Order, and this case is going to give them that. Vincent, how did they get this guy? So um, let's clarify this a little bit. They had DNA from a crime scene back 32 years ago. Then they had a DNA from a napkin. How did they track him? What was the police techniques here? Well, Jesse, it was similar to what they did in the Golden uh, State Killer, right? So there was DNA submitted through these websites like 23andMe, Ancestry.com. So they, will, they were able to narrow that down to, I believe, a cousin uh, that had a similar makeup to that. Once they matched that, they pinned in on this suspect. And then once they were able to pin in on him, they actually retrieved the nap. And what's interesting in this case, Jesse, to me is when the investigator that was surveilling this guy... Uh, he noticed he wrapped a napkin up really tight, and then he actually put it in a separate bag and wrapped that bag up really tight. So I think he knew, based on what's going on in technology today, especially with the Golden State Killer, I think he knew that his DNA was linked to this crime, so he wanted to try to discard it as best he could. I'm pretty unbelievable. John, do you think that this is going to change in the sense we're going to see more arrests, more convictions now that technology has changed? I think that's why we have uh, cold case units cropping up all over the place, because now we can connect the dots in cases that years ago we could not. Is it going to be subject to dispute? Sure. But at least when you've got the science to prove something occurred, it, it really is compelling evidence to a jury. It's a pretty remarkable case. You can go to lawandcrime.com to follow a little bit more about it. But speaking of cold cases, as I talked about at the top of the hour, we're covering the Timothy Coggins cold case that is now red hot because multiple people have been implicated in this murder of a 23-year-old black man back in Georgia in 1983. I can't stress this enough. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we have a live feed into that courtroom. A new witness is on the stand. Let's go live, and Vincent and Jonna and I have a lot to talk about. Some pretty incredible testimony there from another witness who says that Frank Gebhardt committed this crime against Timothy Coggins, killed Timothy Coggins. Another witness who's come forward and says that Frankie admitted it, admitted it, admitted it. Want to bring on real quick Vincent Hill. Vincent, I know we have you via Skype right now. You're watching that. Uh, when you're investigating these kinds of crimes, these cold cases, we talked about it a little bit earlier. What is this like trying to get witnesses who said comments or may have said comments or may have had interactions over 30 years ago? Well, you have to take them for what they say, but also you have to take into account, is there anything that may have changed in their statements from when you previously talked to them versus now? A lot of people will say, oh, this person is lying because this is not what they said five years ago or 1985, or as this individual said that uh, Frank Gephardt told the story. So there's a lot of things you have to take into account. Is there anything that would say this was a complete lie, or is there just slight variation that would say, Okay, slight variation, still the story is exactly the same. Pretty, uh, pretty incredible. And again, I'm here with uh, long crime analyst uh, Jonas Spillbore in studio. What did you make of that witness? And, and I guess the million dollar question is, can a jury convict this guy based upon all these witnesses coming forward and saying that he confessed to them? Uh, short answer, 
Yes. Think about this. The evidence is as good as its source. Prosecution's position in this has got to be the jury has to think that this testimony is reliable and that this witness is credible in order for them to believe what's coming out of his mouth. I'd say, based, uh, he was pretty raw there. He uh, used a, a racial slur a million times, um, attributing it to the defendant in this case. That was hard to hear every single time. It, it, develops, it develops the defendant here as a complete racist, and he explained why he's coming forward now. I think it was very truthful and credible evidence. Oh, it's things. It's things hearing that term over and over and over again. But then again, there's no DNA evidence linking uh, Mr. Gebhardt yet. We are still looking at this uh, case. A new witness is on the stand, Jared Coleman, a GBI special agent. We'll jump in there in a minute, but before we do, have to update our viewers about something that's going on in that Kentucky Marine murder case. It should be noted that the trial of Quincinio Canada and Dewan Malazam, the two men who have been charged with killing Jonathan Price and shooting his wife, Megan Price, the courtroom has the, it's been moved to a bigger courtroom right now to accommodate the massive amount of people in the courtroom. The size of that gallery is getting larger and larger. Everybody is following that case, and you can go to longcrime.com to follow a little bit more. We are going back live now into Georgia, back into the Timothy Coggins murder trial. I want to break out of this testimony for one second and bring back on Vincent Hill, law enforcement expert. When you hear about an investigation that was either tainted or botched or deliberately dropped or not a lot of attention brought to it, what do you think about that, Vincent? What's your opinion of this investigation? Well, uh, Jesse, quite frankly, it's sickening, and it, it tells me that back in 1983, I don't think they wanted to investigate this the way they're investigating this now. I mean, I think we had, even back in 1983, everything we needed. And you heard that GBI uh, investigator say, hey, this was closed way too quickly. I mean, you can't close a murder case that quick, especially you heard how he described the crime scene. It was vast. There was blood everywhere. The tire tracks, everything was there. So Jesse, quite frankly, it tells me they didn't want to investigate it the way they should have back in 1983. And it should be noted that multiple people who have been implicated in this crime, they've also been charged with obstruction of justice. We'll probably learn a little bit more about why it's taken so many years to finally get a trial in this case. But I want to ask Jonna Spilbor, who's here with me as well, why is the prosecution putting forward the evidence of a botched investigation? Why is it important for them to put it forward? Because if I'm thinking if I'm the defense, I'd say, look, they don't have enough evidence here. All the evidence is lost, which is kind of what they said in their opening. But why is the prosecution doing this? I think they're doing it because you have to remember now, we are three decades since this crime plus, since this crime was committed. The jury is going to want to know, why are we here now? Why aren't we? How come we're not 30 years ago? And you need a plausible explanation for that. And I think let's harken back to the previous witness who was giving the testimony that came from, allegedly came from the defendant. He said, you know, the, the prosecution said, why didn't you come uh, forward sooner? I thought he already beat the rap. So right. that, I think, is going to be in the minds of the juror. Something happened in that investigation that thwarted it. The jury needs to know that. Let's go back into the courtroom. It should be noted that Jared Coleman, this GBI special agent, is currently on the stand. And we're learning a little bit more about how this cold case was reopened and why Frank Gebhardt is on trial. Let's go. Welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. So there was a little moment there in the case, I wanted in the trial, I wanted to just explain what happened. We believe a juror fell backwards. That's why there was that sudden commotion in the background, the startle, but uh, trials resumed. We believe the juror's okay. Uh, not to laugh, but I just wanted to give everybody an update about what happened. But I, what I, I want to bring back on Vincent Hill, law enforcement expert. This is really uh, your bread and butter right here. You have the GBI special agent talking about how this investigation was reopened. And I, specifically, I want to talk about when he said the nature of the crime scene gave a lot of indication about what kind of crime is this. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I think he touched on it uh, quite well. I think uh, investigator agent Coleman did. And what he said was, based on the amount of blood, Jesse, that it told him as an investigator that this was a very personal crime, a crime of passion and a, a crime of hate, if you will, because typically, and I've seen in my experiences as a law enforcement officer, if it's a drug deal gone bad, which was one of the speculations of this case, you may see one shot, you may see two, and that's it. But for someone to be stabbed, and keep in mind, stabbing is a very up close and personal crime. For someone to be stabbed that many times, then dragged behind a truck, it tells you as an investigator, this crime in itself was very personal. There was a reason that that message was sent in this case. Yeah, it's uh, 
pretty clear which way we're leaning towards this case. I mean, it's really a br brutal, brutal crime, and I can definitely understand how there is a, a passion element to it. John, we're going to come back. We have a lot more to talk about in terms of the prosecution, what they're doing, but I want to jump back into the courtroom. I don't want to miss anything because this is a critical witness, and we believe the last witness for the state. Let's go back live. Some critical testimony right there about what was maybe thrown down this well at the defendant's property, and was it items of clothing or even the murder weapon in the Timothy Coggins murder back in 1983? That's what we're trying to understand from Jared uh, Coleman, GBI special agent. I want to give a little correction. Earlier, you saw there was some commotion in the courtroom. We thought it was a juror that fell backwards, but it appeared to be just someone from the gallery who fell backwards, but court is resumed, everything's okay. Let's go back to Jonna Spillbore right now as they go into a, a, a quick break here. Is this an effective line of testimony uh, for the state? I believe this is the state's last witness. They're calling him for a reason. Right. They've lined him up as the last witness. Mm -hmm. What's their strategy? All right, so, I mean, this is playing into the whole notion of primacy and recency, right? They want to they wanna end on the highest note possible. So they've got an investigator on the stand who is doing his job. Now, here's, here's the problem for the prosecution. What they want, ideally, is they want the murder weapon. They want other evidence from the crime scene tied completely uh, to this defendant. What they have instead is it appears that this defendant tried to get rid of all the evidence in this well on his property. So you have evidence of him trying to get rid of evidence. And that actually can be big because it shows consciousness of guilt. So the jury might not have a smoking gun, for lack of a better word, right? They might not have the actual murder weapon, but they have evidence that this particular defendant tried to burn items that we think were connected to this crime scene. And the jury is allowed to draw very strong inferences from that. And we're trying to understand if we can believe every one of the witnesses who's come forward and said that Frankie Gephardt told me that he killed Timothy Coggins or references to that somehow. Mm -hmm. What I want to do right now is we talk so much about the statements of the defendant. We have his police interview, and I want to play that for you right now. This was played last week in court. Let's go. Okay. Those are the statements from the defendant in the Timothy Coggins case. That was Frank Gebhardt being interviewed by the police about whether or not he was the one who killed Timothy Coggins back in 1983. Let's analyze this a little bit more with law and crime analyst Jonas Spilbor. What do you think about that? A couple of things. Number one, why is the defendant even giving this statement, right? I mean, obviously he had a right to an attorney. I'm, I'm assuming they Mirandized him. Why he decided to give a statement, I don't know. Uh, number two, I think we can establish that the defendant is a racist. And I say that because now out of his own mouth, he used a, a racial slur that you do not use unless you are a racist. And the jury gets to hear that right out of his mouth. Are you concerned? Yeah, he could definitely be painted as a racist, but is he a murderer? Because what they're saying right there, is, is there a way you could look at the w way a defendant asks, uh, answers a question, excuse me, as opposed to saying, look, I don't know, I don't know who that is, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't this, as opposed to someone who may be, who may be more, really has no clue, like, who is this person? What are you talking about? Are you looking at the way he's answering these questions? It, 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 the way he's answering it, yes, you, you, you can't, you can't base his guilt on his manner, but when you're an investigator, of course you are looking for that. You're looking at the body language, you're looking for the tone, you're looking for any kind of clue like that that a person is saying that may imply there's guilt. Because here's what they're trying to do at the end of the day. He's sitting down and giving them a, a, an interview. They're hoping that he cracks and gives them a confession. Um, doesn't appear that he does that. But getting back to just for a second, the racial component, if the DA has done its job, there was very, most certainly a racial component to this crime. So the more that the jury hears this man saying that disgusting word, the motive and the possibility of concurrence with that crime come closer and closer together. There's an extreme lack of forensic evidence against the defendant, but what right. seems to be hurting him most is the testimony from witnesses who have said that he confessed them. And then, as you just heard, his own statements that are a bit questionable at best. Mm -hmm. But here was the opportunity for the defense because uh, Captain Mike Morris, who was the one who authenticated that tape, the one who actually interviewed uh, the defendant, he was under cross-examination by Gebhardt's attorneys. Hear how they poked holes in what their client ultimately said. Let's play that for you right now. 
Now, I can analyze defense strategy all day on my own, but I want to ask John a Spillbore about whether or not that was an effective line of questioning by Frank Gebhardt's attorney. Again, we, after we just heard Frank Gebhardt using the N-word to describe Timothy Coggins, denying his involvement in the murder, but, Jonna, was that an effective line of questioning? You know, I'm not so sure it was effective, but it really was the only line of questioning his attorney could could provide. I mean, here you have a guy who's he's all riled up. He's answering questions by police. He really didn't need to answer questions by police. He's not being very, um, you know, he's not being very stoic and just calmly answering the questions. So the jury's going to want to know: Was he answering questions like a guilty guy, <laughs> or is this how is this common for people who are being falsely accused to be all riled up? And now that's going to be for the jury to better out. A lot of moving parts in this case, and we are going to cover it live when it comes back in the courtroom. But here on Law and Crime, that is not the only case that we are covering, and we love to preview our new cases. Unfortunately, the new case that we are going to preview is a very sad one. It's about the death of a 22-month-old baby, a baby that was killed in a drive-by shooting that may have been gang-related. We have a short report about that. Let's show you. This week, Law and Crime will take you inside the trial of two 19-year-olds charged with murdering a toddler in Jacksonville, Florida. 22-month-old Aiden McLennan was the unintended victim of a shooting. The little boy was sitting in a car outside his family home with his mother and grandmother when gunshots pelted the vehicle. Aiden was hit at least three times and died. The drive-by shooting has been linked to gang activity, and authorities believe the intended victim of the crossfire was Aiden's cousin, who was outside the house when the incident occurred. Police say a rap video sparked the violence that caused the shooting. Many of the witnesses are known gang members. The defense will likely attack their credibility. Henry Hayes and Kami Richardson have been charged with murder, attempted murder, and shooting into a vehicle for the crime. For Law and Crime, I'm Rachel Stockley. Thank you, Rachel. A difficult case that we will be covering here on Law and Crime. It is out of Florida. And every time you look at that little picture, the picture of that little boy, it is really heartbreaking. So innocent and caught up in what seemed to be just a senseless act of violence. Mm -hmm. Now, Jana, I know our time together is coming to an end, so I want to ask you about this new case that we're going to be covering. There's a lot of moving parts. They're charged with uh, a murder in the second degree, which is different than first degree. Right. They're charged with attempted murder in the second, first degree. You have a young victim here. Right. Um, two also young defendants. Uh, one of them was actually uh, charged with possession of a firearm by a juvenile delinquent. I mean, there's a lot of moving parts. So what can we expect where this case will go? Well, here's where we can expect it won't go. It is absolutely no defense that these two uh, didn't intend to kill this young victim. As you know, there's a, the uh, transference. When somebody does something, if I try to shoot you and I accidentally shoot into the into the production right. room and somebody dies, that's still on me. It doesn't matter that I didn't intend. And I, I think that's a good thing. But uh, we're going to have to see a lot of information connecting the dots with this with these gang membership, which sometimes can be a little hairy to try to get in because you're not convicting them for being gang members. You're convicting them for uh, committing this heinous crime, which was motivated by their affiliation with a gang. It can get it can get rather complicated from a prosecution point of view. It's complicated and it's unbelievably sad. 22 months old. Really, really Completely sad. Completely innocent case. victim. Jonna, thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure as always. Always a pleasure, Jesse. See you soon. Thank you. And again, thanks to Vincent Hill. I had to sign off him before, but he was great as well. Law enforcement expert and fellow host here on Law and Crime. We are, I was, you know what, ladies and gentlemen, I was going to go to a break, but guess what? We're back live in the courtroom right now in the Frank Gebhardt case, but really this is the Timothy Coggins murder trial, this young black man who was murdered back in 1983. Well, now there are multiple, multiple people who have been implicated in his death, including Frank Gebhardt, the defendant. Now, you see that crowded courtroom right there. Frank Gebhardt is the, one of the defendants. He has been accused of stabbing and dragging this young man by a car. A really horrific scene. Uh, we, we have Jared Coleman on the stand, who's a GBI special agent, talking about the level of violence of this crime scene. In his opinion, that is a sign of passion. This is not a standard killing as a transactional hit, for example, if it was a drug deal gone bad. This was anger-filled. This was uh, filled with rage. 
And the prosecution has been very clear at saying this was a racially motivated murder. Let's go back live into the courtroom right now.